Okay, so um, what day is today? Friday? I, I lost track. All right, let me um, give you an example of something where you can compute the isochrones explicitly, okay? And um, I'll give you two examples, and maybe I'll leave the other one as a homework exercise. So, because the, the easy one is the one I'm going to do. Um, all right, so let's take this equation. Z dot equals Z, 1 plus I, minus, um, or plus negative 1 plus IQ, Z, Z bar. Okay, so wait, let's see, do I want to use that one? Yeah, that'll work. All right, um, yeah, so you've seen this before. This, remember, is the normal form for the Hopf bifurcation, okay? And if we write this in polar coordinates, you can write this in rectangular coordinates too. If you want, if you write it in rectangular coordinates, it's x dot equals, um, minus y minus x squared plus y squared x. Um, uh, I will, I'll let you try and write it. I don't want to, I don't want to mess that up. Um, I'm going to write it in polar coordinates. Polar coordinates, um, z equals r e to the i theta, then r dot equals r times 1 minus r squared, and um, theta dot equals 1 plus qr squared, okay? So there's the, um, there's the polar form, all right? And if you note that if we set q, let's, let's for, for easiness, At Q equal to zero, all right? In any case, what's the limit cycle this thing look like in rectangular coordinates? It's just the circle R equals one, okay? And if we start with some arbitrary point here in X, Y space, and I'll just, I can define this in terms of R, R naught, theta naught, okay? I'll write down, I'll write down everything for Q, okay? For Q not zero, but I'll show you what the isochrones are for Q equals zero, okay? And how you would have, what you would have to do to compute them for Q not equal to zero, okay? So, I'm gonna change this to one minus Q plus I, and then one minus Q, there we go. <laughs> and the reason I do that is because in this case, when R equals one, you can see that that's the, the amplitude of this limit cycle, right? When R equals one, theta dot equals one, and the period is two pi no matter what Q is, all right? So I just did that to make um, the things a little bit simpler. All right, so if we, Suppose we wanted to find what the isochrones are, all right, for this. What we want to figure out is what the asymptotic phase is. So we have this equation, r dot equals r times one minus r squared with r of zero equal r naught, okay? And you can solve this pretty easily. This is a logistic type function. There's a couple ways you could solve um, one way to solve it is just integrate it out because you get um, dr over r times 1 minus r squared equals dt, and then integrate that from r naught to, oh, here, I'll just change it to s here, to r, okay? Just do that integral, this integral, you know how to do that, partial fractions, remember all that, okay? So I'll assume you can do that, and you'll get some function um, r of t semicolon r naught, which will go to one as t goes to infinity as long 
as R naught is not equal to zero. Of course, if R naught is zero, then <laughs> nothing happens, you just stay there forever. Okay? So we'll have this R of T R naught. And now let's write the equation down for theta. We have d theta dt equals 1 minus q plus q. Let me call the solution here r tilde. OK? That's just the, um, with theta of 0 equal theta naught, OK? And so from that, you see that theta of t is 1 minus qt plus q times the integral 0 to t of r tilde of t r naught squared um, or oh, it's better to do it this way. Okay? Right? I haven't done anything except stick this in here. All right? Everybody see that? Plus theta naught. Right? This is T. Okay? Everybody see that? So now, what do you see? As T goes to infinity, theta is going to go zip it around here. Or at every T equals 2 pi, just take sequence of those. All right? So take theta of 2 pi n, OK? Pi. And that will give you the asymptotic phase, because we want to know, because this thing has a period of 2 pi. So we want to know, remember, we have this picture, and things are wrapping around here like this. And what we want to do is evaluate this at t equals 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, and this will converge to the asymptotic phase. Okay? So now you could see why I chose for myself to do the q equals 0 case, because by doing that, I don't have to do this integral. Oh, you can see that this integral will converge, because this guy is going to 1, this goes to and it goes, this thing goes to 0 exponentially fast. All right, so this integral converges, and it goes to some constant that depends, um, it just goes to some constant that depends on R naught, all right? And I don't remember what that constant is. So that's why if, if you sit down with like um, MAPE or mathematical or um, you're any good at doing integrals, um, you can do this integral yourself, okay? And we'll end up with um, the asymptotic phase, but by choosing q to be zero here, then what's the asymptotic phase equal to? Well, this solution, when q is zero, this is just theta of 2 pi n is just 2 pi n plus theta naught, right? So mod 2 pi. <laughs> asymptotic phase is theta naught, all right? Does everybody see that? So what's great about this is, you draw this again. If we start here, <laughs> then the isochrones are just the radii of the circles. <laughs> so people call this thing the radial isochrone clock. So now, here's a fun exercise that uses, do you guys, have you ever heard of the um, law of cosines? 
Yeah, of course. You learn that in like elementary school or something, somewhere like it. high school, high school. Law of course. I don't remember what it is either. So I, I derive it from. So let's see what does a perturbation do to this. So given we have the isochrones, we can now compute the phase resetting curve. How do we compute the phase resetting curve? Well, we perturb in the two two axial directions, okay? So I'm just gonna perturb, I'm gonna only perturb in the x direction. So if I take, suppose this is my current phase theta, okay? And um, I perturb, so I add a stimulus of size A, okay, instantly give it a pulse, okay, you see what I'm doing, okay, I'm, I'm doing the following, I'm solving this differential equation, and then at some point in some point of time or phase theta, I give an instantaneous perturbation by increasing the x value, okay, and it takes you out to here, okay? So now we know that this, we know what the asymptotic phase is if we know what this isochrone is, okay? So if I tell you theta and I tell you A, so here's theta, here's A, what's this, what's this angle right here, I? This is trig, right? How do we figure out that angle? You guys, come on. I should have somebody come up here and do it on the board. All right, well, let's do it. Okay. What is this distance? This is one, right? This is theta. <laughs> What's this distance? That's cosine theta, right? So this is cosine theta. This is sine theta, right? Right here, this distance. This is A. Right here. And so what we want to figure out is um, we want to figure out this distance. We want to figure out what this angle is, okay? And I should have had my notes with me. Help me out here. What's the next step? All right, let me draw this better. Um, this, 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 this is cosine theta, Sine theta, or sine theta A, and we need to figure out that angle, right? So we draw this down here, okay? Yeah, now I got it. That's A, right, also. Everybody good? And this is, um, and what height is that? Well, that's sine theta, right? So now we can figure out what this angle is because this angle is just tan phi, right? Is sine theta over A plus cosine theta, okay? See that? So therefore, phi is arc tangent of sine theta over A plus cosine theta, okay? That's the new phase. And what's the phase resetting curve? Remember the phase resetting curve is you take the old phase, so the phase resetting curve, what's the relationship between, this is the new phase, New phase is equal to old phase 
plus phase resetting curve of old phase, right? Because that tells you how much it advances, right? So for PRC, PRC is just phi minus theta. And that's dependent on PRC of theta semicolon A is therefore um, arctangent of sine theta over A plus cosine theta minus theta, right? Now let's just check to see, a reality check, what if A is zero, okay? So that means we didn't give any perturbation. If A is zero, then this is theta. <laughs> theta minus theta is zero. Okay, that's good. We didn't give a perturbation, we don't have a PRC. So now, what we want to do is take this and divide by A, take the limit as A goes to zero to find the infinitesimal phase resetting curve. Remember, that's what that was? You take the PRC and divide it by the size of the stimulus and then take that to zero. Buddy, with me? All right, good. All right, well, what is this? This is a function that's zero at a equals zero, and this is zero at a equals zero. So how do you evaluate that limit? Huh? L L'Hopital's rule, yes. So what we really have to do is take the derivative of this with respect to a and evaluate it at a equals zero. Well, let's do that, <laughs> okay? Derivative of this with respect to a. Oh no, this see, yeah, yeah. The derivative of this with respect to a is what? One over sine theta over a plus cosine theta squared, right? Plus one. It's a derivative of arc tangent times sine theta over a plus cosine theta squared times, yeah, there, right? That's the derivative of that, right? I think, didn't I do the der derivative of the A of this, right? Derivative of our tangent and then the derivative of that, right? And that's one over x, derivative of one over x is minus one over x squared, yeah. Okay, so now take a equals zero. Okay, and what do you get? You get, um, if I did my algebra, oh this is, yeah, yeah, this is great. Okay, so what is a equals zero? This is one over tan squared theta plus one, right? times minus sine theta over cosine squared theta, right? Oh, have I gotten past the boundary? All right, what's this equal to? Come. Students, my students are just as bad. They don't know any of the trig identities. Come on. Trig identities you should know like the back of your, oh, back of your hand. That's a joke. All right. That's set squared theta. Set squared times cos squared, or cos squared is, or sec, sec squared times cos squared is one. So this is equal to minus. So the infinitesimal phase resetting curve <laughs> PRC for the radial asynchrone clock is minus sine theta. There we go, okay? Perfect, you see? Everybody good with that? So that was just using 
some simple geometry, and the more general phase resetting curve looks like this. Now, what happens as A goes to 1? What do you think happens as A goes to 1 here? Well, as A goes to 1, there's a problem here when theta equals pi, right? Because when theta equals pi, this is 1 minus 1, right? So let's look geometrically what happens if theta equals pi. We're right here, right? And if we give a stimulus of size 1, where does that take us? takes us right to the origin, okay? So we kill the oscillator, okay? So at least somebody here, <laughs> yeah, see? So, so basically, the phase resetting curve you get by finite perturbations, the infinitesimal one you get by letting those perturbations go to zero. Okay, everybody cool? So do you have an idea now what the phase resetting curve is and what the, um, what the isochrones are? So in the case where Q is not zero, the isochrones are curved, all right? And it's much harder to compute the um, phase resetting curve <laughs> because of that curvature. So how do you know what they are? Well, you just have to take this integral Okay, you have to do this integral of r squared. So let me give you a little help in doing this integral, okay? Let me do, do a little help in doing this integral. Since I think you should try this. So we have r dot equals r times one minus r squared, okay? let capital R be R squared, okay? So now, R R dot equals R squared, one minus R squared, right? Which means that um, R squared dot, one half R squared dot, equals r squared times 1 minus r squared, which means that r dot equals 2r times 1 minus r, okay? With r of 0 equal um, r naught squared, right? Now, this is an easy ODE to solve. Okay, pretty easy to solve for this one. Just use um, partial fractions. And that gives you capital R of T, semicolon R naught, right? And now, this is capital R anyway, right? So then we're, yeah, that, that's what makes this a lot easier, okay? So you can get on your computer or you can probably go online and say, ask my calculus professor, what's this integral? You know, there's probably some web source that lets you do stuff. I know my undergrads used to consult the web for all their homework. <laughs> That's why you have to come up with homeworks that are um, unusual. <laughs> okay. So that's all I want to say about that. This is, this is the only, this is the only example I know of where you can explicitly write down. Well, I won't say this is the only example. Uh, let me do a little more general example. I won't do it, but you it's the only. Um, it's it's. This is the no. This is the only example you can write down the general phase resetting curve. Okay, for general perturbations. For the infinitesimal one, um, there's a family of equations like this that will work, 
Okay? But anyway, let me, um, let me move on. Okay, so now let me, let, let, let's ask, what does the PRC do for us? Suppose we have the PRC. Okay, suppose we have a PRC. What good is it? Okay, well, let's, let's consider the following situation. Suppose we have two oscillators. Two oscillators, okay? And they're both with the same frequency. Okay? Or same period, let me say same period. Okay? And we couple them. Okay? So we're gonna take two oscillators, put them together. And we're gonna allow them to interact. And how they're gonna interact? Each time oscillator one hits phase zero, he delivers a perturbation to oscillator two, which is the same as the perturbation we gave to get the PRC. That makes sense? So each time I reach phase zero, I hit this guy with a pulse, and depending on what his phase is, he gets shifted. Each time he gets phase zero, boom, he hits me, with the same pulse, okay? And now the question you want to ask is what will happen with those oscillators? Synchronize? Will they go out of phase with each other? What will happen? So let's develop. Let's, let's, let's go through and figure out how to do this. Okay? So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to develop what's called a map. All right, so what I mean by that is I'm going to assume that I'm at phase zero and he's at phase theta naught, okay? And we're gonna go through one cycle of this so that he will be at phase zero and I'll be at some other phase. And then we repeat that one more time and we'll have completed the cycle because I'll punch He'll punch me once. I'm not really a violent guy, but, I, you know, I live in America, right? I didn't say I was going to shoot you, right? Okay. You just happen to be my victim because you're right there. All right. So let's do this. All right. So let's do number one over here. Number two. All right, so let me make some assumptions to make this a little easier. Definition, let f of theta be theta plus delta of theta. So what is that? That is the new, the old phase plus the perturbed phase. So this is the new phase. Okay? So this is the phi that we computed for the radial asynchrone clock. Okay? So assumptions, assume f of zero equals zero, and f of t, oh, oh here we're going to assume theta is between, oh, here, I'll just make it real easy. No, I'll make it, um, theta is between zero and, um, Capital T, okay? T is the period, okay? So for our radial isochrome clock, T is 2 pi. So I'm going to assume that F of T is T, okay? So that means I'm assuming that the phase resetting curve vanishes at theta equals 0 and theta equals T. 
So that's true for the one we just did over here. It was minus sine theta. That vanishes at zero and at, at two pi. Okay? You don't have to make that, but it makes the calculations easier. More importantly, assume f prime of theta is greater than zero. Okay? So that means that, what does that mean physically? It means that if my phase is behind your phase, and a per, the same perturbation hits us, we'll both get shifted, but you can never pass me. Okay? Because this says that the new phase versus old phase is a monotonic function. So it means that, yes, ma'am. Huh? Could you explain the boundary condition for the new phase again? About what? Could you explain the boundary condition? The, the definition? Boundary, boundary. condition. Boundary condition. The boundary conditions. Oh, oh, the boundary condition, which, oh, f of zero is zero. That one? Okay, that just says that if I perturb him when he's, if I punch him when he's about to spike, it doesn't do anything, okay? It means, for example, if, if you think of these are, as neurons, okay? that when this neuron is ready to spike, okay, when it reaches its maximum spike, then perturbations don't affect it. Okay? That's what it says. And the other end, it's a periodic function. So it just says the same thing at the other end. If you look at neurons, if you look at the phase resetting curves of neurons, it says that theta it says delta of zero equals delta of t equals zero. That's what it says. Is that the boundary? Huh? You have written that f of t equals t. Huh? You have written that f of t is t. Is t. Well, f of t is t plus delta of t. <laughs> and if delta of t is zero, then it's t. <laughs> That's all. It just says that if the perturbation comes at your zero phase or your T phase, it doesn't have any effect on you. If you measure the phase resetting curves of neurons, you know, they almost all vanish at the endpoints, okay, when the neuron spikes. Just because, I don't know why that is, but they do. And for example, with the radial isochrome clock, that's true also. All right, so that's the good to make that assumption because it makes things a lot easier. Okay, this is a more critical assumption. It just says that the perturbations aren't too big. Because what does it mean? F prime of theta is one plus delta prime of theta, right? And it just says that delta prime of theta is never too steep. Okay? Everybody cool with that? So let's work out what this does. So here's oscillator number one, oscillator number two. Oscillator number one is at phase zero. It just is about ready to spike. And oscillator number two is at phase phi. Okay? So instantaneously, this will still be at 1, and this will be at f of phi now. Right? Now, f of phi cannot be equal to, oh, and remember, these guys, whenever they hit t, that's when they fire. Okay? Right? Because the period is capital T. So this, why is this not t? It's not t because of this assumption, f prime positive, because of the monotonicity, phi is less than t, f of t is t, so f of phi has to be less than t, okay? Now, when does this guy fire? This guy will fire 
at t minus f of phi, right? Because he's below, he's below t, and it takes, and everybody goes at the same unit rate one. D theta dt is one, and then when they hit t, they fire. So let me let me draw the picture. In absence of anybody else, this is what happens. I grow, bam, I get reset to zero. So this is t, zero, and this is slope one, okay? So it takes me t to get to that, all right? So that's what they do. And now I'm coupling them together. So every time this guy fires, he makes the other guy shift his face. Yes? Huh? When the oscillator is at phase zero, oscillator one. Oscillator one, I'm assuming is at phase zero. Uh, then he gives a perturbation to oscillator two. And he will perturb oscillator two. So it fires. Right? Yeah, it fires. Yes, yes, yeah. So at this, this is right before, so maybe I should say theta minus and theta plus, right before there, this guy's at phi. Then right at, after that, he's fired and he moves this guy, okay, instantaneously. Okay, is that cool? All right, well, this guy will fire at this point. How far has this guy advanced when this guy is about ready to fire? This is d theta 1 dt is 1, so he's advanced exactly this amount of time. So this guy is now at t minus f of phi, okay? And this guy, because this is the point at which he fires, he is now reset to 0. And this guy is set to f of t minus f of phi, okay? Right? We're almost done. <laughs> and this again is less than t, <laughs> okay? Because f of phi was less than t, t minus this is less than t. See where that assumption comes in? Isn't it great? See, this, you, you, you appreciate the, new, the need for these assumptions. Okay, we're almost done, okay? One more time. When does this guy go to fire? T minus F of T minus F of phi, okay? And this guy is now exactly at this phase, right? So he started at phi right before this guy was ready to fire. So I really should say number one is at T, and then instantaneously later. So this guy has now hit his peak, and this guy is now phi nu. This. So there's our map. So we've gone one full cycle. Oscillator one fired. He perturbed oscillator two. Oscillator two fired, perturbed oscillator one. Oscillator one is poised to fire, and now we figure out the phase. So we now have a map, phi end after each, iter or phi new equals t minus f of t minus f of phi, there we go, right? That's a map. Do you guys know about maps? Iterate it each time. So you can think of this as after one cycle, phi n plus one is this phi n, okay? Let me call this g of phi n, okay? You see that? Everybody good? You sure, all right? So let's check something out. 
What do you want to do with a map? You want to see what the equilibrium, the fixed points are. So a fixed point means phi n plus 1 equals phi n. Okay? Let's try, suppose, what is g of 0? What's g of 0? What is g of 0 equal to? Well, let's run it through. f of 0 is 0. That gives us t. f of t is t. E, t minus t is 0. So g of 0 equals 0. Okay? That's synchrony, right? That's a fixed point, an equilibrium point. Now, when you want to do stability, when you, want to, when you have a fixed point of a map, oh, well, let me have a little aside here, all right? In case um, some of you guys probably know a little bit about discrete dynamical systems, but let's suppose you don't, okay? So let me, let me say a little something about a discrete dynamical system. Suppose I have yn plus 1 equals h of yn, okay? So this is a map from, and, and y is n dimension, or m dimensional, okay? And let's suppose I have a fixed point, y bar equals h of y bar, okay? And now I take the derivative of h, evaluate it at y bar, and I get a linear map. Okay, where a is the derivative of h with respect to y, evaluated at y equals y bar. Okay? So this is easy. We see that y n equals a to the n y naught, right? Just get that by iterating over and over again, right? Right? You see that? That's, that's easy. You don't have to integrate anything. It's just iteration. Okay, so the question is, um, stability, you want a to the n goes to zero, okay? Right? And what that means is you want all the eigenvalues of a to have magnitude less than one, all right? So that's what we need for stability. So let's study the stability of synchrony by taking the derivative of that g, okay? What is g d phi equal to? Equals minus f prime of t minus f of phi times minus f prime of phi. Right? Just calculus, which is just equal to f prime of t minus f of phi times f prime of phi. Okay? Uh-oh. Okay? And what's that equal to? That's equal to 1 minus or 1 plus delta prime of t minus f of phi. Times 1 plus delta prime of phi, right? Because remember, f of phi, f prime of phi is 1 plus delta prime. All right, and so dg d phi at zero is equal to one plus delta prime of t times one plus delta prime of zero. Okay? Right? 
at the four. That's the condition that you need for stability. For example, if delta prime is negative at the origin, and it's periodic, then it's going to be negative there. Then it's just something less than one times something less than one, and that's less than one. So synchrony will be stable. So if your PRC looks like this, Okay, this is theta, delta of theta. If your PRC looks like that, it has a negative slope there, right? And a negative slope there. And that slope is not too negative because of this condition. Then you get stability of synchrony, okay? You see? If your PRC looks like this, synchrony won't be stable because this is positive, this is positive. One plus positive times one plus positive is greater than one. Synchrony won't be stable. So the shape of the PRC matters. What's kind of interesting is there are some neural PRCs some neural PRCs where the slope at one side is not the same as the slope at the other, okay? So this is kind of cool because it's one plus the slope at one, it's the slope at one side times the slope at the other side, basically, okay? Now, you could, so here's a fun numerical exercise. Get a plotting package. Okay, probably have those, right? And plot this function g of phi for say delta equals sine of theta or something like that. And you'll find that there's another, there's another guy in, uh, uh, oh, don't use sine, but use delta equals say alpha sine theta, okay? Try it for that. Alpha could be negative or positive. Don't make it too big, like negative a half, positive a half, or something like that. That'll work, okay? Try, try plotting this g of phi, and you'll see that there's another equilibrium point that's somewhere close to, if you sign, somewhere close to pi, okay? That's the antiphase solution. What I mean by antiphase, it means that we alternate, okay? So before we go on, I want you guys, you guys are gonna do an experiment now. So you don't, you're gonna have to not be embarrassed to do this experiment. This is a finger tapping experiment or hand slapping experiment. So what you're gonna do is you're going to Slap your hands alternately, okay? And you're gonna do it faster and faster. And just relax and do whatever feels natural, okay? So go ahead. Now I want you to go faster, faster. And eventually, like she's doing, eventually you'll synchronize, okay? Okay? And what's happened is, is that, um, has anybody here ever walked a dog or walked a horse or anything like that? Okay, so I have, I have a couple of dogs and I watch this all the time. There was a, I, I just did a, I just read a paper, I reviewed a paper um, just a couple of months ago on this. They had dogs on treadmills, okay? And the dog walks when it's on a slow treadmill, okay? A walk is a specific gait that, that you, your legs alternate in a cycle that's a quarter of a whole cycle each. And I don't remember the ordering, but quadrupeds, four-legged animals, they walk in a very specific way. Like, you know, one, two, three, four, okay? And it's always like that. And so at low speeds of the treadmill, the dog does a walk. But as you start to speed the treadmill up, 
the dog makes a transition to a trot. And a trot is the diagonal guys going back and forth. So it's reduced, it's synchronized two of the legs, okay? So what you've done by starting with this, you can think of that as a walk, and as you've sped up, you've had to go to this synchronous gait, okay? It works even better if you do it with your legs. People have recorded um, any, you know, muscle, um, whatever, um, electromyograms and things like EMG and things like that, and people do this, all right? Dogs, too, on the treadmill, they make this beautiful transition from this walk gait to a trot gait. Um, and both of my dogs, one of my dogs never trots. She walks really fast or she goes to a gallop, okay? But the other dog walks, she's older and she really makes a transition quickly from a walk to a trot. The trot is the most efficient gait for a quadruped, okay? So basically what's happening is the change in frequency is alternating, is altering the shape of the phase resetting curve of the neuron or the, the pattern generators that hook all your legs together and allow you, spinal generators that allow you to walk in that way. I, in fact, the things that allow animals to walk are not centrally governed. I mean, they're modulated centrally, but they really are in the spine. There's a preparation called the spinal cat, okay, um, where they uh, basically um, separate the brain of the cat from the rest, the, the body of the cat. These experiments were done back in the old days, okay, and and. Cats will walk fine on a treadmill like that, and they, they do quite well. In fact, it's really amazing if you put a, a block, something there at a block, okay, this leg will hit it and then lift up, but then before this back leg hits it, it automatically knows to lift up. So that's all controlled below the brain, okay? Anyway, so that's why PRCs are useful, they allow you to determine what happens with synchronization between oscillators, okay? Now this calculation is much more difficult if the PRCs are slightly different and they have slightly different periods, I mean, but it's still doable as long as they're not too far apart, okay? So is everybody cool with this, All right? So that's where they're useful. So now I want to go to a more general scenario and take us to weakly coupled oscillator theory, okay? And that's, this is gonna be a little technically difficult, all right? So I wanna set things up and then I'm gonna, you know, I might just skip the steps, okay? But let's set this system up. D U one, or let me call it, D X one D T equals F of X one plus epsilon G of X two X one, D X two, I'll call it G one, two, dt equals f of x2 plus epsilon g of g2, x2, x1, okay? So this is two guys. Epsilon is a small parameter. When epsilon is zero, I'm going to assume that each one of these guys undergoes the same autonomous limit cycle. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that du dt equals f of u, u of t plus t equals u of t. Okay, gonna assume that. Now, Now, technical stuff. Okay? Okay? 
That's defining an inner product. This is the usual dot product on a function space. Okay? So let's study a little property of that inner product just briefly. You know, don't want to do the details of this. All right. I, I will just sketch the idea of this. We look at this equation and we differentiate it with respect to t. Okay? Let's differentiate this with respect to t. We get d squared u dt squared equals derivative of f evaluated at u times du dt. Right? From the chain rule. Everybody good with that? Okay. Yes? That's the chain rule. Well, that means that d by dt of u dot equals a of t u dot, where a of t is exactly equal to the derivative of f of u of value of df of x evaluated at u of t, okay? It's a periodic function, okay? So if we consider the linear operator L, L is going to be a linear thing that operates on periodic functions. L v is minus dv dt minus of t v. Okay? So what this operator does is it takes any differentiable periodic function v, it's its derivative, remember v is a column vector, subtracts it from a of t times v. a is a matrix of that. Okay? That's what this does. We see that L u dot equals zero, okay? So this has a one-dimensional null space. So it's not an invertible operator. You can't find an inverse for it. However, you can solve L y equals b of t as long as b of t is in the range of this. Now you remember my little discussion yesterday, this will be in the range of this if this, this is in the range if it's orthogonal to the null space of the adjoint operator. So the adjoint operator is defined, remember the adjoint is defined by u l v equals L star U, right? Well, L star turns out to be L star V is exactly equal to minus DV DT minus A transpose of T A, all right? And you can show this by using this inner product and using the um, integration by parts. Because you have u dv dt, right? Integrate that, you'll get uv minus v du dt, right? Remember from integration by parts. See, all that old crap that you learned in calculus is really, really important. Okay, there's a reason for it. Okay, so basically we just have to find the null space of this, okay? And the null space of that, believe it or not, all right, that let L star, let Z of T satisfy minus dz dt minus a star of t z equals zero, okay? 
along with the condition that z of t dot du dt equals 1. That's a normalization condition. Okay? Let it satisfy those two things. Okay? This is a normalization. That's just the regular dot product. Okay? This is this would be the null space of this guy. Okay? And this is just the normalization with respect to the null space of, of um, okay. I know this is really abstract, but bottom line is we'll get get we'll, we'll completely be able to understand what happens here. Okay. So now, all right. Okay, everybody cool? So let's, before we, before I go on, let me tell you what Z of T is. Believe it or not, you have seen Z of T. Z of T um, I keep losing the eraser here. Z of T <laughs> is exactly equal to the gradient of uh, that phase function. Remember the phase function, which gave me the isochrones? Evaluated on the limit cycle. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That's the infinite. Each component of this is the component of perturbation along that variable for the infinitesimal phase resetting curve. So Z of t is biologically, I mean, you can measure, okay? Okay, but now I'm going to take you through the perturbation theory, okay? And I'm going to use a method called the method multiple scales, okay? Two time scales. Don't worry if you don't really understand all this, okay? Don't worry about it. The point is that you'll get a form, at the end, we're going to duke out a formula here <laughs> that, that you'll be able to use and put a few buttons in XPP to compute, okay? Just doom, 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 okay? Really easy. Okay. The buttons are U A N U A H <laughs> or U A N escape <laughs> redraw <laughs> if you want to see what things look like and then U A H <laughs> escape <laughs> redraw and that'll give you <laughs> there. That's all you need to know. They're perennials now, can write these down. Okay, uh, ready? Here we go. We're going to do the perturbation. So we have to pull our pants up, all right? You always have to pull your pants up when you're ready to do a perturbation, okay? Because perturbations are, you know, crack your knuckles or something, because they can be hard, okay? This one's a pretty easy one. All right, so here's the idea. So we're going to assume that x1 and x2 are close to u with some phase shift. 
because remember, he used an autonomous oscillator and some small amplitude corrections. So let me, before I go on, let me geometrically kind of explain what's going on. Okay? So suppose that epsilon zero, okay? Then what do I have? I have two oscillators. Okay? And because they're stable, everything's going to sit on those oscillators. We're going to be sitting there at that rhythm. And so we can characterize each of these by one variable each. It's phase. Okay? So if I know the phase of oscillator one and the phase of oscillator two, I know the state of this system. Okay? So these two together form what? This is a circle, and this is a circle. So the space of well, what's a circle across a circle? It's a torus, right? But it's what we call a flat torus. <laughs> and we're going to unwrap it, and we'll just draw it on a square. Theta 2, theta 1, all right? And we make the identification of this edge with this edge and this edge with this edge, right? To make a torus, you guys, you must have made a, right? You know what I mean, right? I fold this in here and I get a cylinder and then I take those two terms and I glue the cylinder together and I get an inner tube, a bagel, right? A torus. So what is the, what is the system when epsilon is zero, what, what do the, what does the flow of this look like on here? It's just a bunch of parallel lines, right? With slope one, right? Because what's the solution to this? This is theta one, the, the equations of this, are theta one dot equals one, theta two dot equals one. That's the differential equation without any coupling. Because it's just zipping around there mindlessly forever. Right? And so this flow looks like that. Okay? So what we want to do is when we turn the epsilon on, it's going to distort this flow. And we want to understand what the equations. So theta 1 dot equals 1, theta 2 dot equals 1, plus epsilon plus epsilon times something. Okay? And what we need to do is figure out what that something is. Because if we do that, then we know what these two guys do when they're coupled. Does this make intuitive sense? Uncoupled, they just do what they want. As soon as they can start to talk to each other, that distorts this. Maybe they'll all funnel together and they like to go synchronously. Okay? Or maybe they hate each other and they go anti faith Or maybe they give, you know, similar behavior. It's almost like they weren't coupled. Okay? It can't be chaotic or anything because there's only two of them. You can't have chaos in two dimensions. Okay? So. So, let's recall, let's Let's put this ugly old analysis to work here. Ly equals B of T has a periodic solution if and only if B of T in the null the orthogonal complement of the null space of the adjoint. Well, what's that mean? If and only if 0 to t of z of t dot b of t dt equals 0. b is orthogonal to the null space of L star, right? And the L, null space of L star is this famous Z of T, which is, in our minds, the infinitesimal phase resetting curve. When we do neurons, the only coupling is going to be via the voltage, right? All right. And if 
I think next week you're doing um, some ecology things. And there, it's, it's maybe more interesting because the coupling between two patches, suppose you have two oscillatory predator-prey cycles, the coupling is how easy it is for one prey to and predator to migrate into the other patch, or you could have thousands of these patches with little interact, little way to migrate. Then it depends on who can migrate better, whether the prey or whether they'll synchronize or not. Okay. So, just remember this. So now we're ready. We're going to write x1 of oh, and let tau equal epsilon t and s equal t, okay? So s is a fast variable, tau is a slow variable, and we want to look for solutions x1 of t comma epsilon is equal to x1 hat of s tau epsilon, okay, and x hat is t periodic in fast time s, okay? So with that in mind, d by dt is d by ds plus epsilon d by d tau, right? Because this is just using the chain rule. S is T and tau is epsilon T. <laughs> so we're going to assume that X1 hat of S tau epsilon can be written as X10 of S tau plus epsilon X11 of S tau plus so on. And x2 hat of s tau epsilon equals x20 of s tau plus epsilon x um, to, I'll put the one up here. <laughs> so then it's not so easy. Okay. All right. So now we just plug all this crap in. Okay. Right? So we'll plug it in. You know, instead of this X11, I'll just call this Y1 and Y2. How about that? That's better. Okay? All right, let's plug it in. The x10 ds equals f of x10 of s tau. That's the lowest order, okay? Because there's an epsilon here, no epsilon there, no epsilon there, epsilon there. So what's the solution to this? We're looking for X1 has to be T periodic in S. The solution is X1 0 of S tau has to be equal to U of S plus theta 1 of tau. Because it's going to be the oscillator plus some arbitrary phase shift. And that phase shift is got to be independent of S, but it depends on the slow time. Isn't that cool? So we get x20 of s tau equals u of s plus theta 2 of tau. Oh, I'm going to finish this perturbation. This is fantastic. OK, good. I'm going to finish it before break. Let's do the second order term. OK? Let me define a of s to be equal to the derivative of f with respect to x 
evaluated at x equals u of s. Okay? So that's that linear, linearized thing. Gazoon height. All right. Ready? D by D tau x10. That's an epsilon term. Plus dy1 ds. Right? Because that comes from this guy. And this term, epsilon, okay, has to be equal to A of S plus theta 1 times Y1. Why is it S plus theta 1? Because this is evaluated, derivative of this is evaluated at U of S plus theta 1. Okay? plus g1 of x1 naught, well here I'll plug it all in, u of s plus theta 2 of tau, comma u of s plus theta 1 tau. Okay, because to lowest order, x1 is this, that's just this, and this. Okay? Similarly, oh, and what is this equal to? Let's do this derivative. Okay? We can write this as d theta 1. We can write this as u dot of s plus theta 1 d theta 1 d tau plus let me, let me rewrite this. I'm going to write this as L of S plus theta 1 Y1. I'm doing that to emphasize that this is all S plus theta 1. Y equals minus, minus, you guys are going to kill me because I'm destroying your chalk. Okay, okay. minus du ds of s plus theta 1, d theta 1, d tau plus g1 of u of s plus theta 2, u of s plus theta 1. Okay? So all I've done is rearrange things to make it look like this. We similarly get l of s plus theta to y2 equals minus du ds of s plus theta 2, d theta 2, d tau plus g1, or g2, of u of s plus theta 1, u of s plus theta 2. There we go. Okay? Two more equations. Look, this is of the form L y equals b, okay? So there's no solution to the list unless b, this is orthogonal to z of t, right? But remember, z dot du ds is 1. Remember that? Because that was one of the normalizations. So we're almost done. Yes, well, we're, we are. So let's apply the orthogonality condition. We need zero to t, z of s plus theta one. Why is it z of s plus theta one? Because this is, this operator L is shifted by theta 1, so its adjoint has to be shifted by theta 1, 2, okay? Dot minus 
du ds of s plus theta 1, d theta 1, d tau, plus g1 of u of s plus theta 2, u of s plus theta 1. ds has to be equal to 0. Okay? We're almost done. And we have a similar equation for the other guy. Ready? So now, z of s plus theta 1 dot du ds of s plus theta 1 is 1. So we can pull that out. So that becomes minus t d theta 1 d tau. Here, this part. Because this dot, this is 1. <laughs> Integrate 1 with respect to t. <laughs> you get t. <laughs> okay? Plus 0 to t. Z of s plus theta 1 dot g1 of u of s plus theta 2. u of s plus theta 1 ds has to be equal to 0. That means that d theta 1 d tau equals 1 over t. Now, here's the cool thing. This is a periodic function. So if we make a change of variables, we can shift by theta 1 here. That will do the same thing there. And then that will just give you theta 2 minus theta 1. So this is just d 1 over t, 0 to t z of s dot g1 of u of s plus theta 2 minus theta 1 comma u of s ds. Okay? And I'm just going to call that equal h1 of theta 2 minus theta 1. Okay? And we have a similar equation for theta 2. So voila, we have solved the problem. And we now have an equation, a phase equation, we now have d theta 1 d tau equals h1 of theta 2 minus theta 1, and d theta 2 d tau equal h2 of theta 1 minus theta 2. We're done. Okay? We've taken this system, the original system, which was m dimensions and m dimensions, and it's now 2m dimensions, and we've reduced it to two dimensions. Can we reduce it even more? I mean, what's easier, one dimension or two dimensions? Somebody answer. Come on. One, right? One. Let phi be theta 2 minus theta 1. D phi d tau. Well, we can get rid of the partials because they only depend on one variable. Okay? D phi d tau equals d theta 2 d tau minus d theta 1, d tau. What's that equal to? That's equal to, where'd the eraser go? Ah, here, wait for it. H2 of minus phi minus H1 of phi. which is just some function g of phi. We reduced this to a 1D system. So we get phase locking. We get a periodic solution to this if D, this has an equilibrium point. Suppose this has an equilibrium point, and means theta 2 minus theta 1 is constant. And it means that the original solution, um, x1 and x2, are just faces of each other. 
Okay, isn't that cool? So we've taken a big system and reduced it to one equation. Now, you can imagine if there were many other variables, if we had many, many more guys, if we coupled hundreds of guys together, then we just get these H's of functions of multiple things. And this is perfect because we will now apply this to neuroscience, okay? All right, so there you go. That is, um, that is the weak coupling, and we'll apply it shortly.